But there's a sense in which there's just kind of like a life pain, <laughs> you know? There's just dissatisfaction, there's disharmony, so you're always behind the ball. This, this essay should be called On the Sufferings of Suburban Life. Yo, what up? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who study philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week, we're going to jump into an academic text of sorts. But don't go running for the hills, for those of you who just want to hear us bullshit and talk about ass-eating and those other, other semi- are they adjacent, academically and intellectually adjacent? I think after topics? the 100th episode, we have a brand now and we're never going to escape it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're going to be talking about an essay by Schopenhauer, the philosopher, that is called On the Sufferings of the World that I actually think that people are really going to vibe with because I just sent out a tweet from a quote saying that, damn, Schopenhauer is a real downer, talking about how the longer you live in your life, basically the worse it gets. We'll get into this a little bit more. Um, and like within instance, I already had like a couple of retweets and a handful of likes, but like about a dozen likes. And I was like, damn, people really gravitate to this pessimism shit nowadays, don't they? <laughs> yeah, man. Schopenhauer is having that uh, comeback tour right now. <laughs> he is on the comeback. He's like He's on 65 the revival. years old, can't really get up the stairs to get to the stage. <laughs> Barely remembers the song, but it's okay. Everyone's but still like throwing the panties up on the stage, you know? That's right. As long as you can churn out the hits, it doesn't fucking matter, right, dude? <laughs> Just got to do a whole lot of coke, you know, 15 minutes before the show. That's Hopefully right. Hopefully you last so will be, a heart attack. This will be the cocaine uh, version of Schopenhauer. So it'll be a very <laughs> upbeat speed through of On the Sufferings of the World. But of course, before, uh, before we get into that, we want to give a shout out to our sponsor over at Mubi. That's M-U-B-I. Mubi is an online streaming service, and they perpetually have 30 curated films in a rotation where a film is in the rotation for 30 days and then it drops off at the end. So then that means that a new film is being added every single day. So you constantly get this fresh influx of new material, and they specialize in indie darlings, um, classics of cinema, old classics from Hollywood, and then, of course, regional films around the world. And they're truly fantastic. They run all kinds of spotlights and director's fortnights where they're focusing on particular people, actors, etc., etc., and they're absolutely fantastic, and they are offering our listeners an extended 30-day trial if you go to mubi.com slash owls at dawn. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash owls at dawn. And Troy is going to tell you about a film that has caught his eye in his library. Yeah, so the film from Mubi that uh, I want to talk about today is one of my favorite films of all time. It's technically a documentary, but as you'll see as we talk about it for a minute here, it's not really a documentary in the traditional sense. And that's Grizzly Man by Werner Herzog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Werner Herzog, almost everyone knows, as the kind of uh, dark, despondent German filmmaker who has many parodies of himself that exist out there in the world, um, given mm -hmm. his, like, deep, like, sonorous voice, right? And uh, he did a film back in uh, the mid 2000s, I believe, called Grizzly Man, where he follows around an environmentalist named Timothy Treadwell. Um, and his desire, um, kind of ultimately tragic desire, to become one with uh, grizzly bears in, I forget where it is located exactly, some nature preserve mm -hmm. or something. And it's not really a documentary in the sense that it's not supposed to sort of give us a um, a detailed view of Treadwell's life or a, an environmentalist's movement for, you know, preserving grizzly bears or whatever it is, right? It's more about what Herzog is usually almost all about, and that's humanity and nature and um, mm. the sort of usually conflict between the two, but also sometimes the harmony. And I think that this film captures that in the most beautiful way because even though it's mostly just Herzog philosophizing over hmm. this story, it's basically like a, like a really beautiful blog post that happens to be really long, um, ruminating on Timothy Treadwell's life, it really gets to the hearts of the duality between the harmony and conflict between nature and man. And it's, that's a huge, big philosophical theme, right? 
but it, he captures it in such a way that man, you just feel it. Did you have a similar experience when first watching this film? So I saw it when I was probably less intellectually developed than I am now. And so I feel like for me, when I saw it, it was just more like, oh, this is the dude that thought that he was going to be one with the bears and then got eaten by the bears. Like, isn't nature fucking scary? So it was much more superficial when I saw it. I'd like to revisit it. And since then, of course, I've read think pieces and excerpts and talked about it. And so I think I've, I've like post facto intellectualized it. And I think I'd rather just get that kind of poetic experience by watching it again. So I, I, I need to revisit it. Yeah, it really is a poetic experience. It's not necessarily like a deep philosophical, if for a documentary, it certainly is deep and philosophical, but compared to sort of, you know, philosophical um, ruminations, like maybe we're going to talk about with Schopenhauer in a minute. Uh, it's not quite at that level, but you really, it's a kind of thing you really feel more than anything. I, I can never forget certain scenes from this film and the way that they made me feel and maybe part of that's just you don't expect that coming into documentary, so you kind of feel a little bit overwhelmed by it. But um, mm. I think it stands the test of time. Uh, and it's one of those great examples of a film that can be about something so small and yet plummet to its ultimate depths. And that's oftentimes mm. the greatest pieces of art of that way, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. Um, so it's on your so- list. Yeah, I, so for people that are listening, libraries vary around the world depending on where you are regionally. So obviously I'm in Australia, so my library is different than Troy's in the United States. So in my library at the moment, I mean, I've got a lot of stuff that I am not familiar with. A couple of names that I recognize, but none of the titles that I'm familiar with. So I can't outright recommend one of them. But what I can do is I just want to say that one of the cool things that they're doing uh, in my library at the moment is they're doing these direct from Locarno viewings. So this would be films that have just been screened at the Locarno Film Festival, which is in Locarno, Switzerland, which is one of the best, if not the premier, let's say, avant-garde, experimental, um, more industrious festival. Um, it, it sometimes will get some of the bigger films that get wide releases um, well, I mean, and it does always get films that get wide releases, but it also really focuses and has made a name for itself in doing like more independent and experimental and like I said, art house type of cinema. And so they've got about five different films that are direct from the Carno, which means these are, this is the first time that these films have um, been seen that have gotten distribution. So you can kind of get on the front line of that and see what is on the cutting edge of art house cinema around the world right now. So it's the uh, direct from Locarno series. And this is the kind of thing they constantly do where they'll run these types of series or they'll run uh, retrospectives on directors and stuff like that. So that's just pretty cool. Um, so check some of those out. And uh, if you want to do that, go to movie.com slash owls at dawn. Again, that's movie. M-U-B-I.com slash owls at dawn and get a 30 day free extended trial. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to support us in other more tangible ways, you can go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. We have several tiers of support for you there and you can get goodies such as bonus episodes, which we release every once in a while when we're feeling up to it. Um, the monthly newsletter, which has extra sticky leaves and shitty minutes in it and access to help us choose patron sponsored episode topics, which we have coming up in the very near future. Yep, yep, yep. Should we get into this thing? Let's do this. All right. So before we get into the main topic, talking about pessimism and stuff today, we got to get to the shitty minute. This is the part of the episode where one of us talks about whatever it is that's grinding our gears and driving us crazy this week. So Austin, is it your ab workout? Have you, have you <laughs> no, turned man. against it finally? No, man. I mean, I was struggling a little bit this morning, but I pushed through and I actually am in a great place with it. Uh, so we're still going. No. I went and I saw a play a couple of weeks ago. I saw a Brecht play called The Life of Galileo, and it was really quite lovely. It was in this uh, nice little theater here, and then this theater has a couple of different actual performance spaces, and we were in the upstairs theater, which is this black box theater, which I tried to estimate how many seats. I'd say there were somewhere between, you know, 200 and 300 so i was thinking somewhere around 250 ish uh, occupancy and it was theater in the round so it was this really intimate space and it was a lovely experience um the play wasn't perfect but it's i was describing it to a friend of mine actually earlier tonight when we were kind of walking around i said um it's kind of like the leaky bucket argument that you get with certain apologetics defenses that like each individual argument 
isn't strong or like each individual component isn't sufficient in its own right, but together it creates a solid whole. And that's kind of how I felt about this play, right? So this sounds like a sticky leaves, but here's the turn. Um, but then I was looking around in the theater while I was there and I was really saddened by the demographic that was there. It was, I would say, 90% over the age of 50 years old and um, white. And then I would say the rest was a, you know, a kind of smatter or scattered uh, demographic, but it was mostly uh, young people, like younger than me, like late teens, yeah, m mid to late teens, so you could tell that they were probably like drama students. Um, and then a couple of people that were like my age, 20s and 30s, right? But it was mostly older, older people. And it really just bummed me out because it made me think, and I don't know who these people are. I don't know what their socioeconomic background is. But having spent enough time in my life in the theater and then going to the theater, it just kind of reminded me that theater is sometimes just closed off from so many people in the world. And it oftentimes is just this luxurious, artistic... Um, privilege to be able to go to the theater and I and I almost was thinking to myself and this is a bit rhetorical but I think there's some truth to it so I don't mean it entirely but feel the rhetorical weight uh, I kind of was sitting there thinking that wow theater is wasted on the rich in a lot of ways and of course I don't mean that entirely I think that there's still value that can be seen by people who have money and or value can be uh, I guess, disseminated, let's say, for people who have money that can afford to go to the theater. But I don't know, the the potency and the power of what live performance is able to do completely just bypasses the majority of populations because this is too fucking expensive, man. And it is. Like, my tickets were pretty expensive, you know? Um, so, yeah, man, it fucking sucks. Theater, it's, uh, it's wasted on the rich, is how I feel. That's kind of my shitty minute. I thought this was going to become a diatribe on why we need the UBI. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then what we need is we need more spaces that are state funded. We need, um, there's a lot of things that we need to do. We need to stop disinvesting in the arts. We need to create spaces and encourage people of, of various communities to to see the value in theater, to introduce them at a young age. But because there are so many barriers to entry because of the kind of class relations that are embedded within the theater industrial complex, let's say, um, people, there, there are like preconditions that foreclose people from being able to experience theater at a young age, right? Like I was very fortunate to, I mean, I, I did school plays uh, when I was very, very young, but my aunt, I, I will never forget it. The first time that I saw a big, huge production was The Phantom of the Opera when I was, God, I must have been nine, somewhere around there. Eight, nine, ten. That's so awesome. Me and too. <laughs> yeah, it was. One. It was. Yeah, and it was a tour that was coming through to Los Angeles, and um, I remember I was I was so excited to see it, and it it changed my world. I was in the front row. I mean, the front row. Uh, like before the show started, I was looking over into the orchestra pit, and I was just so amazed that these musicians were right there that the sound was so rich and i was in this theater it, it was in la it wasn't the pantages i think it may have been the the amundsen which i don't believe is there anymore yeah it is. um oh it is no what's yeah. the one that got what so the amundsen is there what's the one that's no longer there I'm um sure. oh god i can't remember the name of it there's one that they changed the name that I, I can't remember what it's called now but so maybe it was it was the amundsen it was in that like downtown theater district right mm -hmm. um and uh, and we saw the show, and it was absolutely amazing. And I remember I could see the makeup on the actors' faces, and I could see the sweat beads on their brow. And I remember this at 9, 10, whatever I was, years old. And it literally changed my life. And I was very fortunate because I had an aunt who, uh, as, a, as, a, as a single woman herself, had become a relatively successful, you know, middle, middle, upper class entrepreneur. And so she was able to afford a fucking front row ticket to take her nephew to. You know, um, and 
And so then I've just made it like a part of my life that I will be involved and that I will uh, attend theater and I will work in theater somehow for the rest of my life. And, and, uh, and it's because I had those, those opportunities at such a young age to find that love and to find that joy. And so many people don't get that, man. So it just fucking sucks, I think. Yeah, dude. It's interesting, the kind of sociological factors that surround the theater. I mean, I don't know anything about it, but what didn't, wasn't there like a, a selected cordoned off space for, uh, at the Globe for Shakespeare plays um, for people who were extremely poor that cost basically nothing? Mm, like I see. I'm not familiar. Something? Oh yeah, definitely. Standing room only stuff has existed. Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And I know in New York, uh, if you want to go see a Broadway show and you're a student, for example, you can get there and they have like these overflow tickets and you can get them for like it, the last time. I mean, this is years ago that I did this, but uh, it was like, you know, you get them for like 20, 25 bucks or something, which is a great deal, right? Because normally I think they're probably in the 60, 70 and upwards into the hundreds if you're getting good seats, um, dollars. But you can go like last minute, the day of the show, and try to get uh, the kind of overflow tickets. The tickets haven't been sold yet. And they always restrict a certain amount. Like say they have like 100 tickets that they're going to give to these people. And people know this. And so they go and they stand in line and they wait for these overflow tickets. And uh, and so that's great. So that there are options. And then, of course, you can see off, off Broadway, off, 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 off Broadway, whatever. And I mean, just regionally, you can see stuff. But even that, like, this is just a regional small playhouse here in Sydney. And the tickets were in the $50, $60 range to go, hmm. you know? So, I don't know. And then, like I said, man, just looking around, the demographic really spoke to uh, just a, a pattern and a tendency that wasn't just a one-off, but something that, you know, even as I've performed and done touring shows and spent years and years in the theater that you see this it, it is it's it's generally middle class or middle upper class people that go to the theater um it's not really a working class media you know because it's not something that you can really consume cheaply or easily or, and and people just don't get into it it's not really marketed to them as well and that really fucking sucks and there's um there is a a uh, a school of theater that was developed by a guy named, guy named Augusto Ball. I'm not sure how he would say his last name, but it's B-A-O-L. And he is a Brazilian playwright, um, performance theorist, etc. And he uh, developed this approach to theater inspired by the works of Paulo Freire, um, which Paulo wrote uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And so um, Augusto Ball's form of theater was called uh, Theater of the Oppressed. And that's where you get a lot of like invisible theater or he develops this term called the spect actor where the spectator and the actor, the, the divisions between them, the lines between them are blurred and it's much more of a sort of egalitarian theatrical process. And there are all kinds of other things that come out of theater of the oppressed. But he's intentionally trying to overcome this class division that you find that's kind of ingrained within the theater world. And so that's good shit, but it just, it really fucking bums me out, man. Yeah, I wonder if there's a connection between or something interesting about the fact that you have the theater, right, which is heavily hierarchical in terms of the audience, right, in terms of cost and how close you are and stuff like that, right, and the class divisions that are obvious there. And then you have movie theaters, which are heavily democratized, right, in comparison. And then mm. you have sporting events, which are just as hierarchical, in fact, more mm. so than the theater. But then, and the class divisions are clear there as well. But then there's actually a kind of a pride to being up in the nosebleeds because you're like the real mm. fans, right? Like you have some connection that the rich assholes mm. don't have because they're just there to be seen or whatever. Oh yeah, like if you're in the fucking box or something like that, you you're not one of the you're not one of the real. That's why you the Who owners are that, trying to get right? their yeah, and the owners try to get their sign value right by being like, I'm gonna go down and be with the fans, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the only the only reason to be in a box is if you don't actually like the sport because then you can like eat a yeah. bunch of food and just chill. Yeah, and then, like you said, there is that prestige thing. You can kind of show off and gloat that you are one of the wealthy and one of the privileged. That's interesting. Yeah, I wonder if there'd be some way to utilize that similar dynamic in the theater, right? To kind of rejig how we can instill a sense of pride and connection uh, in people's communities to go to the theater and to not to not kind of feel this degradation because you're in the nosebleeds, right? And then maybe to to kind of 
more intentionally start to create productions that kind of have the quote unquote nosebleeds. The problem is, is that a stadium has 15,000 upwards, you know, that's basketball stadium, a football stadium, college football stadiums have like a hundred thousand fucking seats, right? A theater has maybe a couple thousand, right? Unless it's like some huge, massive production, but you know, you're, you've maybe got a couple thousand um, seats, so you don't have as much leeway. And then the theater's really expensive and production costs are really high. So you got to make your money back and they know that people will pay because you can keep appealing to the wealthier clientele. So there's a fucking, there's some other deeper structural problems here, right? Because you're not making money from merchandise. I mean, yeah, if it's Phantom of the Opera and uh, Les Mis or Cats or something like that, you've got your IP. But you know, if it's just the new Broadway show or just the, like the local professional production at the, the regional theater that you're going to see, they're not making any fucking money from that. So they've got to charge the expensive prices so they can pay for all the production costs. Yeah. We just got to get, um, theater into these giant football stadiums to be like guys in the nosebleed seats going, fuck yeah, Jean Valjean. <laughs> I mean, for like shows like Les Mis and shit, they do that. Like the 25th anniversary um, concert, have <laughs> you ever seen that? It's like fucking, you know, I don't know how many thousands of people there, but yeah, it's crazy shit. Like, are that. you but, serious? <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah, dude. So they do that sometimes, where they'll do like big, huge, crazy performances for these gnarly shows that everybody loves. But for a Brecht play, The Life of Galileo, where you got 250 probably people, not. <laughs> probably not. You know, and the actors have to get paid, the director, and then of course the actual theater itself and all kinds of other stuff. So, I don't know. Theater is wasted on the rich. That's my maxim. Yeah, man, I agree. All right, so should we jump into this uh, main segment here? Yes, let's do it. So, for this week, we're reading Schopenhauer's little essay on the sufferings of the world. And uh, I would definitely encourage anybody out there who wants to read this before listening to the podcast to do so. It's like 10 or 11 pages. It's very short. It's super pithy. It's a very quick read. You don't really have to have any background in the philosophy to uh, to get much of to get out anything out of it. So um, definitely do that if you feel inclined to do so. Um, Austin, I want to get your like initial off the cuff reactions to reading this piece. Okay. Um, I find it intriguing. I find it very insightful. I really like a lot of his use of images. I was thinking a lot of psychoanalysis while I was reading this death drive, Freud, cessation of pleasure kind of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ultimately think that it hurts my heart when I read this. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I was expecting. <laughs> Do you get a because, sense of like I just don't understand this comportment towards the world? No, I I I remember what I don't remember when it was a couple episodes ago where I said I I felt like I, I I'm starting to, to to like sense the world passing me by sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I I get this sorta like I I can I can sample it. If it's like a cheese board, I can taste it. It's not like the whole meal. Like I can't devour it like I can a whole meal. But it's like I'm able to like sample a little bit from the display before me, you know? And um, but I can't eat the whole thing. Like it's too it's just, the cheese is too funky. Even though I actually really love funky cheese. It's never too funky for me. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. It's that I'm able to to taste it, but I can't just consume it all. Um but I think I, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. Um, I, I do think that I would say theoretically, I also think that there's something missing from this. But I also, with that said, I think that there's actually something really quite um, insightful about what he's saying uh, and how he's going about it, particularly the relationship between how suffering is related to this sort of um, kind of perpetual process of uh, I guess in psychoanalytic terms, I would talk about it as like the manufacturing of desiring machines, right? Or the desiring production where um, the, the suffering or dissatisfaction or misfortune is a sort of like self-induced process based on our expectations that we're perpetually 
thwarting, or I'm sorry, that we're perpetually thrusting before us, but that we're always thwarted from realizing. And even when we do realize them, that that realization of it is actually, it's only done through like great toil and exertion and things like that. And so even that is is not exactly like a just some sort of absolute good or like the attainment of the pleasure isn't a good. And there's actually, I can't remember who it is, but there's a Stoic philosopher. I think it's either Marcus Aurelius or someone who talks about um, like sitting on the seashore and marveling at the beauty of a sunset or something like that and saying that, yeah, this is beautiful, but what the philosophers don't understand is that it's only beautiful insofar as it's actually alleviating suffering before that, right? So that there's like this disharmony and then at that moment it's it ceases because there's this expression of harmony or this experience of harmony. And so there's like this weird duality to it. And so in that sense, I kind of get it. But yeah, I I don't know. It's It definitely is different from my disposition to the world. What about you? Yeah, so I mean, I share a little bit of that because I, I don't think that I have a, a generally pessimistic outlook on life just as a just naturally, not even philosophically, just in terms of my intuitive response to life. Um, and nor should either of us we have very privileged you know, lives and childhoods and everything. So um, if anybody deserves to, to like live in the an optimism, it would be us, right? Um, but yeah. at the same time, I, I find stuff like this really, really interesting to me philosophically, or at least as a challenge to my intuitive outlook. I mean, yeah. get more into this later, but I, I love it because it takes suffering seriously in a way that I think having sort of been introduced to the, to the world of thought and to the life of the mind through a religious and specifically an evangelical Christian lens, I feel like oftentimes suffering is not taken seriously. And I think I read the Bible so much, and, and especially in the Hebrew Bible, suffering is taken very seriously all the time. And I, that just didn't seem to match up with what I was being taught and being told about the nature of suffering. So I always had this kind of yearning, like it was like, um, like you listen to like, you know, top 40 on the radio, right? But then you hear somebody who's playing like, like indie rock or some underground rock. And you're like, man, I will listen to fucking Fugazi, man. I hear this stuff sometimes. Mm. I'm like, that's not on the radio, but it's gotta be right. That's the good stuff. And mm. You only get a little taste of it when you're in the record store or something. And so you want to get more of it, right? You want to kind of dive deep into it and really explore that world. So even though I think philosophically, I, I don't have this orientation towards the world that Schopenhauer has. And I don't think that theoretically it, it lives up. Um, as like a systematic philosophy, I think it's super interesting to kind of dive in for a while, swim in it, and uh, think about what you can do with it. Yeah, I, I agree with that fully. Absolutely. I really like, you talked about like, you know, the kind of optimism that we have is kind of coming from privileged backgrounds. And one of the things that he might even argue to that as a counter is, well, then that's precisely what um, is still mystifying you. You're like the child that's still at the play, right? Anticipating the curtain to rise and you just haven't really experienced the downfall yet, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're still, you still think that the world is potent and that your hopes and your dreams and your futures are still on your fingertips. And you just haven't realized that as of yet, um, or you just haven't realized yet that those things are not actually going to, um, come to you, that those things are actually always foreclosed from you or forbidden from uh, your attainment of them in full anyway. The thing that I, and I love that, I actually think there's something really lovely about that because for me, it's the it's the relationship between expectation and realization um, or expectation and the possibility of the actualization of those expectations where tension and where dissatisfaction emerges. And I think a lot of times we we tend to create our own dissatisfactions or we magnify or intensify our dissatisfactions or let's say even within our, our thrownness into situations that are not of our own choosing, our dissatisfactions are intensified based on um, the the demands that are imposed upon us that then sort of induce a set of desires or that induce a type of expectation, um, a sense that we can be satisfied by following certain paths or certain courses in life or thinking certain ways. And so it's that it's that inducement that can kind of almost be um, a self-perpetuating process because then we feed into it more. And I was thinking about the superego injunction here, which is, you know, the more innocent you are, the guiltier you are. So the more fidelity you kind of feed into these hopes and expectations, then the more sort of 
um, piety you have to infuse into them, which then creates a sort of more frenetic set of demands that are imposed upon you to realize them, which means that the likelihood that you're actually going to realize is it um, becomes less and less. And so that kind of stuff I thought was really interesting that I was thinking alongside this, right? Yeah, you see the, the Buddhist influence there, right? Obviously, everyone knows Schopenhauer was very influenced by Buddhist philosophy, and you see that idea of like desire being at the root of suffering um, yeah. very clearly here. Yeah. The thing that I don't like, though, is how he then turns it into a metaphysical absolute. And that is where I think I would disagree. Not because it's metaphysical per se, but because it seems to be a metaphysics that is necessary and not contingent. And I would like to think of it as, okay, maybe let's even grant that the form of suffering that he's talking about, let's say the logic or the mechanism of suffering and misfortune that he's discussing as pertaining to, um, he calls it a general rule, right? It's It appears as exceptional, but it's not. It's a general rule. Um, so let's say that even, even if we say that suffering is like the de facto state of affairs because of our maybe meta-conscious linguistic tendency to have our like desire and our expectations exceed our grasp. So maybe there's a sense in that. That would be like a psychoanalytic reading, right? Which I'm totally cool with. But then what I don't know that I like is that he says that therefore it must serve a purpose and that it doesn't derive from chance. And that is where I part ways. Yeah, it's definitely a setup to be, um, to get him to the like, weird, pessimistic, redemptive solution that he wants at the end. Um, so I think he has to mm. set up the tables that way. But yeah, let's, start, let's talk about like the actual argument here. Because um, okay. I think you can probably take it as being less metaphysical if you wanted to, and it still holds a little bit, but then your okay. the outcome becomes different, I think. The first line of the whole essay is kind of tells you straight up what the thesis is going to be, right? Unless suffering is the direct and immediate object of life, our existence must entirely fail of its aim. It's a pretty great mm. first line, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about like succinctly stating your entire thesis in a pithy way in one sentence like that. Mm. So the idea is that suffering has to be the telos of life. Otherwise, life is a failure and does not achieve its end. So the only thing capable of, of being an end in life truly is, is suffering. Um, that's pretty dark and despondent, right? He brings up the, I love this, the uh, evil's privation argument that stems from, I think Augustine was the first one to really bring this one up, right? But it yeah. became popular amongst Protestants a little later too. Um, and the idea in, on the uh, evil's privation argument is that evil is not an actual positively existing thing. It's not an existent. It's a lack of goodness, or it's a name we give to a lack of there being goodness. And the, mm -hmm. the point of that isn't just for semantics. The point of it is that it gives you a kind of rhetorical way of getting out of the problem of evil. Um, the problem of evil being the question of how a good God, an entirely good God could allow evil to exist if he is also all powerful and capable of yeah. eradicating evil. So will you just say, well, uh, evil isn't actually a thing. It's just a lack of goodness. And so there's no like causal mechanism for it, right? It doesn't actually exist and need an explanation in that way. And um, the argument that you can, it's obviously just wrong on the like the metaphysics level because obviously even a lack of something needs to have a cause. So mm. at that point, the question still remains. And so I never bought that argument for that reason. But then the argument that Schopenhauer gives is actually just to reverse it, <laughs> right? He doesn't even question <laughs> yeah. the premise, really. He just reverses it and says, actually, we find pleasure to never really be as pleasant as we expect it to be. And pain, however, is very much more painful than we expect it to be. So actually, it turns out that's much more likely that good is just a sort of or like uh, happiness is just a privation of suffering because suffering is the de facto state of life. And then we get these little moments of goodness or happiness in them intermittently, like you were mentioning, by looking at the sunset and being a, like a cessation to suffering. And he ties that mm -hmm. back into desire as well by saying basically happiness is just the moment when the affliction of desire ceases for just a little bit. And then it comes back mm -hmm. again in the new way. And I think that's. You know, met metaphysically questionable because I think the entire idea of there being like a privation at this level is just wrong. But it's rhetorically pretty great, I think, because it really is when you think about it in terms of desire being an affliction and then being ceased when we sort of satisfy it and then move on to the next thing. Very few things are as intuitively obvious as that, right? 
that mm. desire is kind of an affliction that drives and motivates us. And then it ceases for just a little bit, but then happiness is so ephemeral and just goes away. Everybody yeah, knows because, that. Yeah, because desire is triggered from a lack, right? Um, maybe it's based on a simple biological need, hunger. And so you desire food uh, because there's a lack. And that lack is a state of dissatisfaction. You know, it's a state of displeasure. And so then you eat and you are satisfied. But that satisfaction is, according to Schopenhauer, is never as pleasant really as you expect. Although I'm not sure. I've had some amazing sushi and ice cream in my life and it just fucking <laughs> blows my goddamn mind. But it's never as pleasant as you expect. Or at least, let's say, the pleasure that you derive from that isn't nearly as intense as the pain that you experience or as the potential pain that you can experience. And I thought there was something really interesting about that. And it's because it makes pain primary or let's say disharmony um, primary, right? Um, misfortune, the... Um, the unbounded, not the the harmonious or the perfect world. He is talking about Leibniz here, right? And so Leibniz talks about like the best of all possible worlds. It's this world that is sustained by God perpetually. Um, for Schopenhauer, no, he wants to kind of flip all of this and unpack it all. And rather, the good is negative and uh, misfortune is positive. And it actually makes me think a lot of Freud's death drive, and then, of course, the pleasure principle, right? So the death drive is that desire to overcome and to uh, to to cease that disruption and that disharmony, right? And it's precisely that disruption and that disharmony that kind of like stimulates the drive, that stimulates the body, that moves you forward, that, that creates action. If you were perfectly satisfied, if you were content, there would be nothing, or in Schopenhauer's words, you would just fall into pure boredom, right? There would be no action. There would be no movement. There would be no motion because everything would just kind of cease to be. It would just be static. And what that makes me think then is that there's something excessive about pain that doesn't quite exist for pleasure. So pleasure is good. It feels nice. It might be satisfying, but it's not excessive, whereas pain is is excessive for Schopenhauer because pain is that promise of death or the promise of disruption of pleasure. So it becomes the sort of the engine or the motor that drives the will, right? Yeah, Schopenhauer does say that there's some times when pain, when pleasure, excuse me, can be so ecstatic that it almost makes you die or kind of paralyzes you. But that's very, very rare. Whereas pain all the time, like every day almost, there's a moment where you're so much in pain that you have to literally stop from doing anything else. You can't focus on anything else. That's a daily occurrence, and especially if you're older or you're sick or whatever, that, that's going to be almost like the, the sort of underlying uh, default status, like baseline of your life. And that's not a thing that we get with pleasure, right? We almost can't get it with pleasure. It would be, it'd be too overwhelming. Yeah, and, and I know hedonists might disagree with this, like a total optimistic hedonist might disagree with this, but there is a sense in which if you think about it, just practically, you wake up in the morning and the alarm goes off and you're a little groggy. It doesn't feel good, right? And you kind of are in a state already of maybe you're hungry, maybe you're thirsty, maybe you got to piss, um, you got to go to work, you got to go to class, you got to make breakfast, you got to pack your lunch for your kids, whatever it is, there's like a demand that's already being imposed upon you even before you're kind of consciously awake, right? So the moment that alarm goes off, you're already behind, so to speak. And so you're already in this state, maybe not even necessarily of immense pain, like you were just talking about, like with somebody who's got a chronic illness or something. But there's a sense in which there's just kind of like a life pain, <laughs> you know? There's just, there's just dissatisfaction. There's disharmony. And so you're always behind the ball. And so, okay, you accomplish all your tasks. You get your breakfast. You pack your kids' lunch. Uh, you get dressed and you go to work. But even all of this is still being driven by that need to kind of keep up with the thing that is perpetually before us, right? And then you get in your car and you got to fill up your gas tank and you got to, you know, spend your money and whatever it is, there's, there's this constant lack that is always pulling us forward. It's almost like rather than it being behind us, it's in front of us pulling us rather than pushing us, right? So that time is kind of like always perpetually in the future. And I kind of think, because he does talk about that, he talks about that 
like, oh, that time ceases at, at, at some times, but then it just leads to boredom. But that normally that time is always kind of like disrupting us and kind of, I got the feeling that it was all about this hope in the future and that his notion of temporality is always about like this, this dissatisfaction that is induced from the imagine the imagined future that we're always projecting. Yeah. Like, that was kind of, yeah, go ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because I had a question about that that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, okay. It seems like he's he's in this duality between pain and pleasure or between happiness and dissatisfaction. He's always has this anticipatory framework, yeah. right? It's a thing that's coming yeah. eventually. It's like the, the end goal of whatever action that you're doing. Um, do you think that that misses a huge part of, I mean, maybe it's not best designated pleasure, but it's it's sort of a, like a familial relation with it. The kind of like happiness or pleasure or satisfaction you get from things that like psychologists call flow states, things where you're yeah. just kind of lost in in the world of something, like when you're reading a great book or watching a great show or the theater in the middle of you know an rapturous experience or whatever. There's like long terms. I mean, the conversations we have on the podcast are very much that way, right? You just get kind of lost mm-hmm. in things and forget about everything else, and that's it's not pleasure in the same sense as when you eat ice cream, right? Um, yeah. but there's a certain sense in which I think most people would say those are the most meaningful and good experiences. And you'd rather have those than have ice cream if you had to choose. Right. And it mm-hmm. seems like this, this, you don't necessarily desire those in the same way you desire ice cream where you anticipate it and you kind of fantasize about it and then you go and get it and maybe it doesn't live up to the expectations. And so you're a little disappointed. These kinds of things which are more meaningful don't really have that kind of structure to them. And I wonder if maybe the way that Schopenhauer is setting it up here doesn't really account for that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to kind of press this a little bit further into a sort of pseudo Deleuzian terrain. But what I would say is that what's happening in those flow states is that you're making these connections, right? That these various machinic assemblages that each have a type of potency, a, a conatus, a will, and a, a striving to survive or persist in their own being or to overcome or whatever, they're making their connection. So when you're at the theater, it's like my body, and I mean my the totality of my body, not just like my, phys- my physical senses, but the totality of my conscious bio-psycho-social self is making this connection with these other, you know, uh, psychobiological beings and then this this uh history of this play and this theater and this space and maybe the coffee that i had outside and and we can call it a flow state or we can think of it as just these various connections that are all fusing together to to create like a super organism right but that we're perpetually super organisms there's never a state when we're not super organisms it's just times when the super organism is kind of more potent than other times based on the connections that you're making so maybe sometimes when you're sitting at your desk and underneath the fluorescent lights in your uncomfortable suit that you have for work and your boss is yelling at you um, the machinic assemblages that you're making don't stimulate that potency so you can't reach that quote-unquote flow state or you can't reach uh, the type of assemblage that might maximize your potency and so what I wonder is, is does he neglect the possibility of sustained assemblages, right? Or sustained potent connections. And that's where I think that I would ultimately part from him, is that he doesn't seem to allow for the possibility for that. And I, maybe it's just because I have a sunnier disposition, but I really do think that that shit is possible, you know? Yeah, and you know, and I think when you think about it in those terms, you can also have a new place for the afflictive stages, right? Or the, the, what you call them like the less potent stages. And I might think of it like as the abstracting um, and individualizing mm-hmm. of yourself. You're never fully individualized, but you can be more individualized than when you're in one of these assemblages or flow states, right? And so yeah. those actually have much more meaning because you can actually think about and abstract about the nature of those stages and their meaning. And you can get your own kind of pleasure and meaning from that as well as think critically about what it is that you're doing and whether you should be doing it, right? Because there can be some problematic aspects to those things as well. You know, obviously the person who gets their flow state out of being at a Nazi rally is much different (laughs) than someone who does it at the theater. So I think that those, it provides a different framework than I think Schopenhauer is giving, which I think is much more, allows much more opportunity for redemption than Schopenhauer's does. And I think there's some, evidence that Schopenhauer kind of recognizes that he does a point where he even says, what would man be if not for affliction? He needs affliction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise he wouldn't do anything. 
And I, and I like that because it, he's kind of like tipping his um, hand a little bit here. And, you know, I think even Kant had a similar point. And it wasn't necessarily about pain and pleasure. But the idea that you know, for Kant kind of um, controversially, he thought that God didn't make choices because God isn't afflicted with anything. And so mm. we, however, have like this weird um, antagonism between our inclinations, like our desires and things like that, as well as our ability to reason and to abstract from those things and think about them and decide on them. And that kind of almost like an afflictive nature that we have allows us to make choices and to do things. And that's what makes us human. Um, mm. And God doesn't have that. So God doesn't really make choices and doesn't really have any sort of psychology in that sense. And I like that because it sort of pictures in a more abstract way that's not like moving towards this automatic pessimism um, that we're able to move between these stages and even not just stages, but like this spectrum, right, of individualizing and then collectivizing and, um, and or assemblage, assemblageizing. What's the word that, <laughs> that you would use? As- assembling? Assembling. It doesn't, doesn't <laughs> no, like quite complicated enough. It doesn't, no. Assemblageization. <laughs> <laughs> deterritorializing and re-territorializing that's a delusion term there you go <laughs> yeah um, this is a total aside but I wanted to mention this before I forgot because I thought it was like the best part of this whole paper um, there's one point and this is where I was getting at the idea that maybe this doesn't have to be taken as metaphysical as, as Schopenhauer presents it where after the evil is privation argument that he reverses he says now some people also say that the pleasure is in greater abundance in the world than pain is and so at the very least we can be more optimistic about our opportunities for pleasure compared to pain and his response is so great he says if the reader wishes to see shortly whether the statement is true let him compare the respective feelings of two animals one of which is engaged in eating the other <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's oh, man, right. that was such a great line it is so good yeah because obviously the pleasure of the animal that's that's eating is getting some pleasure, but what about that motherfucker that's being devoured alive? Yeah, that pain is is exponentially greater than the pleasure uh, of eating something. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I wonder if part of that is because, not to press this rhetorical point too far, but because when you're eating something, you could eat of different options, but when you're experiencing the pleasure, you're kind of, like, you are singularly uh, immersed in that situation, right? So the pleasure of me eating this animal versus that animal versus that animal, it kind of, it isn't so intense, right? So the, it's not like the, the pleasure um, is created by like this scarcity. Whereas like if it's the last cantaloupe I could ever eat on planet earth, I might treasure that like nothing else, right? But because I have other options, I could eat other things or I could eat at another time or whatever. But when you are experiencing the other end of that, it is like just Everything that is a part of you is experiencing that singular um, point of pain as a ma- as a pure magnitude. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, you can think about it as like a master slave thing as well, right? Where what does the master get out of the slave? Not that much, marginal utility, right? But the slave yeah. has to give his or her entire being to be a slave. That's it. Um, so yeah, mm. it's that same sort of dynamic, and yeah, it's kind of awful. Um, mm. what did you think about his comment about when old friends get back together and how, yeah. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I, I have this highlighted and I wanted to talk about this. Um, but real quick before that, I did want to ask you something though, cause it kind of relates to what we were just saying. What do you think about like, um, like the beauty of the ordinary or the everyday, right? Like, this is something that Schopenhauer neglects that I find, you know, very appealing in the poets, for example, I'm doing some reading right now and, um, been reading a lot of, uh, because it's inside of a text that's really engaging with him, but like Dylan Thomas and um, some various other writers, but particularly Dylan Thomas, D.H. Lawrence, um, some T.S. Eliot, who, I mean, the pessimistic on, on that side, but um, some George Orwell, uh, a guy named Bill Brandt, Leslie Lee, these poets from, from Britain in like the interwar period. And there's something about uh, the kind of beauty of the ordinary of the parochial that that Thomas in particular is fascinated by that I think is really appealing to me that someone like Schopenhauer seems that he would just completely neglect, right? He would kind of see it maybe as trite almost, but I don't yeah. think it is. Yeah, I don't think that he's necessarily 
ignoring it. I think he has a, a place for it, but it seems that, and I think anybody look at Schopenhauer's flair for writing, you certainly see someone who cares about like the passions and who cares about like the aesthetic features of life. Right. I bet you. Yeah. He is a if, great writer. I think if anything, Schopenhauer probably loves those things as much as anybody, but then is just overcome by the fact that in the grand scheme of things, he feels like those things are just a, a brief and momentary cessation from suffering ultimately. And to say otherwise is basically to lie to yourself. So I think he has a certain mm. place for him, but it's a derivative one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So go on to the point about the two friends. So let's just read the passage. He says, if two men who were friends in their youth meet again when they are old after being separated for a lifetime, the chief feeling they will have at the sight of each other will be one of complete disappointment at life as a whole. Because their thoughts will be carried back to that earlier time when life seemed so fair as it lay spread out before them in the rosy light of dawn, promised so much, and then performed so little. This feeling will so completely predominate over every other that they will not even consider it necessary to give it words, but on either side it will be silently assumed and form the groundwork of all they have to talk about. And then this was the bit that I thought was quite interesting, but... I like all of that, but this is, I like, uh, he who lives to see two or three generations is like a man who sits sometime in the conjurer's booth at a fair and witnesses the performance twice or thrice in succession. The tricks were meant to be seen only once, and when they are no longer a novelty and cease to deceive, their effect is gone. Um, so you want to know what my initial reading was yeah. when I, when I read this? I actually thought about politics here. Um, and I was like, I wonder if there's a way to think about this if we open this to a, like a larger socio-political set of concerns. And I was like, particularly like so much of millennial despair at the moment seems like that it is formed on a very similar type of groundwork here. So that that all that they have to talk about is how these promises that they thought would be held out to them, the promises of the American dream, the promises of presidents, the promises of their parents, you know, the promises that were inherited through advertising and commercials that promise satisfaction or whatever are performed so little, right? And so there's this perpetual, almost like self-reinforcing condition because the groundwork, the platform, the very platform um, is constructed upon disappointment and failed promises. And so then I was thinking, so like a psychoanalytic perspective on this would be to look at the sources of frustrated desire or the processes of frustrated desire production. And then maybe the more critical political economic perspective would be to look at the social structures that create the frustrated desires. And that's what I was thinking about when I initially saw this, but that's kind of like a metaphor or an analog of it. What do you think? Yeah, I think that it seems like what you're looking at is more like the the genus of which this old friends getting together is the species. Yeah. And this idea of frustrated desire. Um, I think that's, that's certainly correct. What, what I was kind of getting out of this and was interesting to me was it seems like he's saying when you get together with old friends and you're a bit disappointed in, um, in your sort of uh, being brought back together, right? Like everyone's experienced that at some point, right? Um, he locates the, the nexus of that as being, how you had anticipation for your adulthood that didn't come to pass. And you get reminded of that. It's like a reverse nostalgia, right? Um, mm. so that was interesting because that's not usually how I thought about it. Because my thought about it was whenever I've had an experience where I haven't seen a good friend in a long time and I get back together and it's a little disappointing, it's not just being disappointed in sort of my early imaginative thoughts for my life. It's more like I feel like I don't know this person as well as I imagined I did. Because to me, it's like I want to go back to being so intimately connected with them when I was in high school or college and saw them almost every day. And then now they're just kind of a different person. And I feel like I don't know them. And I'm disappointed that I missed out on knowing them this whole time. Or in the mm. worst case, they're a different person and I don't like who this person is. Like they're <laughs> not the same person in a bad way, maybe. And that can be judgmental mm. and wrong. But ultimately, that's kind of just how you feel. I was wondering, like, what is what does that difference say about um, my reaction versus Schopenhauer's? It almost seems like he's trying to pigeonhole to me this experience that everybody has to fit his metaphysical framework in a way that it just didn't quite seem right to me. And I wanted to see if you had a similar experience anecdotally. Oh, um, I don't know 
I'm trying to think. So I had an experience with a guy who was a best friend of mine. And then after I went through like my Christian conversion, we ended up meeting up like years later. And I was still kind of in like that post evangelical stage. But you know, at this point, I'm studying like philosophy, politics and stuff like that. And so uh, I, I was just in a different headspace than he was. And when we were younger, all we did was talk about like chicks and music and stuff. So when we got together, the only thing we could do was just talk about the old times, right? Because we didn't have anything to talk about now. We didn't know each other then. So all we could do was reminisce. All we could do was share in those past stories. And I remember I walked away from that meeting and I was really upset about that. It really did. It did bother me. I was like, God damn it. I like, Maybe we weren't really friends. You know, the only thing we had was, you know, chasing chicks and getting fucked up together or whatever. And, you know, maybe that's true. And that's okay. You can have your party friends. And I still got friends that are, I would just consider that are like just party friends that, you know, that it kind of, our friendship runs relatively skin deep. But um, I remember that one really affected me and really bothered me, which is interesting because now actually that's, you know, almost almost a decade later now um but we've uh we've actually like rekindled and now we're like really super tight right and so it was just that i think we were both in a phase where we just didn't know how to relate to each other anymore um and and i do actually think that it has something to do with an anticipation of the future but it has to do with when we were younger and we were in a band together for us we thought that like the world was ours you know and there was like this vitality and like this virility that we were just going to like fuck the world and impregnate the world sort of thing, <laughs> right? And and in that moment, together, as, a, as an assemblage, we weren't going to fuck the world together. And I wanted to spread my seed in other fields. And he, I don't even know if he was trying to spread seed at that point. I, I can't even really remember, you know? But there was this sense in which there was like some sort of disjunction between like the virility and the vitality and the potency and then our kind of shared experience of how we had had previously had that that vitality and that virility together hmm. yeah i think that's that probably fits a lot more with the way that i was experiencing it just with the addendum that if you want to get that back you need to do the work necessary to like become intimate once again, right? And to understand the person and have that sort of vital connection with them. Again, that that you've lost. Um, yeah, and th- I think that's much more intuitive and uh, fits better with my experience at least than, than the one that Schopenhauer is trying to uh, fit in here. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because he says, so you're going to be carried back, your thoughts are going to be carried back to that earlier time when life seemed so fair as it lay spread out before them in the rosy light of dawn. And it promised so much. So it's like these friends in their youth, their previous bond was built upon, it was grounded upon this openness together. And they shared in that, right? They they shared in their anticipatory disposition to the world that promised so much. And then they go their separate ways, and they were they were foreclosed from those promises. And now when they come back together, they commiserate with one another. And that's the groundwork of their new relationship. It's their yes. commiseration about how they didn't get to do those things. Yes, right? so this is really just a story of like dudes who partied and weren't abandoned in high school and then like ended up selling real estate in their thirties. Yeah. I mean, don't you think this is a very common condition though, especially for like like I don't know, suburban Americans. I bet it is. Yeah, I, that may just be peculiar to us because we're still kind of doing the thing we're passionate about. <laughs> we're lucky enough yeah. to do that, right? And for a lot of people, that's just not reality. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I meet with my friends who are same age, uh, went to school, and they did the kid career thing right out of school, and they're like, "Dude, you're so lucky that you're doing all this stuff." Or they just like their immediate, their immediate tone for me is one of complaint, and. Yeah. It, make, it makes me feel icky. Like, like they just <laughs> assume, they just presume, this is like the groundwork that Schopenhauer is talking about here. It's like they just presume that we're going to bitch together about how terrible things are. And I, the old ball and chain, busting my balls kind of shit. And it's like, 
the stupid fucking humor that you get in rom coms or in like uh, network TV, right? Oh, it's the damn it, my life. I, I had my kids and I had to do the career shit. And it's like, I don't know. I, I think it's a very common experience. I just don't know that it is particular to me as much. Yeah, but this, I can, I can, but I get it. Yeah, go ahead. This, this essay should be called on the sufferings of suburban life. <laughs> totally, dude. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what made me think about like the political thing because I was thinking about like the millennial despair that you're constantly hearing, and I wonder if we can broaden this out and say that, like you said, the genus to species relation. That the genus is this larger logic about when you have those promises held out before you, and you have constituted your life in such a way. When you've constituted your life around those promises. And then those promises um, are ripped from you. Then what happens is, is when you form your community, whether it's your political community, maybe it's a community of resentment, right? A uh, resentment in the Nietzschean sense. But that community can be formed on that groundwork of resentment of the things that were taken from you, the promises that were not achieved and not realized. And maybe what you get kind of with like millennial despair or maybe Zoomer anxiety or whatever the fuck it is is the fact that we live in a world where those promises don't exist anymore and so coming to grips with that is coming to grips with a world that is built on a platform of disappointment and failed promises yeah i think that's that's really good you know ultimately i think schopenhauer here does a pretty good job with the diagnostic critique Um, yeah and maybe even is more potent today than it even was in schopenhauer's time um but let's talk for a minute about sort of his his redemptive solution. Um, okay. Cause this is where I think ultimately that it fails and is not very convincing. Um, okay. So Schopenhauer sets up this whole thing talking about, you know, the nature of desire <clears throat> leads naturally to suffering and that suffering is in greater, much more greater abundance and is almost metaphysically prior to happiness or satisfaction or anything like that. And then he goes for a little bit talking about the various religions. And it seems to me that it kind of incoherent and really more rhetorical piss people off who are Jews and Christians. <laughs> yeah, like even yeah, like the, the Christians of the day. Yeah. And by celebrating Buddhism and, and Hinduism in certain ways, uh to yeah. piss people off, which is definitely, you know, worthwhile in some respect to troll a little bit. And um, and his reading of Christianity, I think, is also a little bit suspect. It's oh, it's, it's a little it's bit totally too off, yeah. It, yeah, it's totally narrow. Yeah. But that's why I think it's rhetorical. He basically says original sin's a great idea. Um but only because it means that suffering is like the uh, metaphysically most primary feature of human life, not because mm. um, it's a setup for like God's plan for saving the world and everyone going to heaven or whatever. Um, so he kind of is doing it, I think, rhetorically just to say, like, set you up for something positive. Here, I like Christianity, original sin, great idea, this thing that most philosophers kind of hate. And actually, no, it's the reverse. It's actually talking about why ultimately popular Christianity in his time would have been German positivism. He's just totally off. Hmm. Um, but then his redemptive solution, something like once we recognize these facts about suffering being the primary feature of human life, um, and we kind of embrace the denial of the will that comes with that. And that's the sort of Christian aspect that he wants to do, right? Taking up your cross daily or whatever, like denying life, right? Um, hmm. We'll no longer be surprised about all the suffering that exists in the world. It won't be like an affront to what we expect anymore. It's just what we expect. It's just the way things simply ought to be. He even uses normative terms like ought and should here, which is interesting. Mm. And then he says, but the, the a redemptive fact is this allows us to be more humble in our own expectations about life, which in a way actually decreases some of the suffering. That's the Buddhist picture, right? And then it also makes us more compassionate towards others because they're fellow sufferers. And he uses that phrase literally near the end of the essay, which I thought was kind of beautiful in its own way. Um, mm. He says, you know, my fellow sufferer um, in reference to like, when you greet people. Um, and he says this, uh, this is the last line of the essay. This may perhaps sound strange, but it is in keeping with the facts. It puts others in a right light. And it reminds us of that, which is after all the most necessary thing in life, the tolerance, patience, regard, and love of neighbor, of which everyone stands in need and which therefore every man owes to his fellow. He has kind of an ethical um, injunction here at the end. I thought it was really interesting because you don't necessarily think of that a lot with this sort of pessimistic outlook. And you see it again earlier in a little passage that I thought was really telling um, where he says something about the idea that when he sees 
a man beating uh, an animal like like his dog. Mm, uh, yeah, says, I, I, I highlighted that too. Yeah, he says, and when I see how a man misuses the dog, his best friend, how he ties up this intelligent animal with a chain, I feel the deepest sympathy with the brute and burning indignation against its master. And I love that mm. too, right? Because you, you get this like really strong ethical, like moral um, motivator here, which is not explicit. It just kind of pops out every once in a while and comes out in the end here. And I think what's interesting is I think it's good that there's a kind of moral injunction here at the end because it, it, it's more than just complaining at that point, right? It's actually saying there's something about this that we should do something about it, right? We should, it should affect how we live. But then ultimately, it doesn't do that for me. It just fails at that regard because it's not necessarily the case that this sort of pessimistic outlook leads towards compassion automatically, I don't think. I don't think that necessarily makes us more humble. It could just make us complaining assholes in the end. Um, I don't know that that one necessarily leads to the other. What do you think about that? Could we say that it's an ontological pessimism that's meant to induce an ethical, uh, rational compassion or a rational, com- uh, or, or uh, and yeah, an ethical compassion? And what I mean is, is that the the ontological pessimism is that look the world is suffering and the that we induce further suffering by increasing our desire and our dissatisfaction right um i have a quote here uh that he well he basically talks about how uh, humans and brutes or animals they ultimately desire the same thing but that humans they um, they contribute to an increase in the measure of their suffering because that our, struffer, our, our suffering, or I'm sorry, our struggling is ultimately for the very same things as the brutes, but with an incomparably smaller expenditure of passion and pain on the part of the brutes. So for us, that we kind of like self-perpetuate our own dissatisfaction by inflating our expectations. And, um, and so what I wonder is, is he not saying, okay, look, the world is suffering and Misfortune is the general rule, therefore adjust your expectations, and then you can um, kind of live a, a sort of more simple life. It almost has kind of an Epicurean uh, tone to it, right? He, he does talk about this at the beginning where he talks about, you know, that there are like these simple pleasures that we need, and it's just like food and protection from the heat and the cold and things like that, some sex, some sexual satisfaction, but... Obviously, and then he says that man kind of creates further dissatisfaction for himself by throwing himself into the love relationship, which more often produces dissatisfaction than actual pleasure. And so, again, it's almost like you're trying too hard. You're, 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 you're seeking too much pleasure rather than just kind of taking a step back and just living a sort of like simpler and more well-adjusted to the sufferings of the world, um, more well-adjusted to the misfortune of the world kind of uh, comportment within the world, you know? Yeah, I mean, I just think that's false. Like, <laughs> um, so says the guy who feels the need to write super long treatises telling everybody else about the abundance of suffering in the world. Like, clearly, Schopenhauer needs more than just the simple pleasures of life, right? To live more like a brute. Um, I think it's fine mm-hmm. to say that we need to look at sometimes when we're our own, our own worst enemy in creating these anticipatory hopes and that we get sort of enslaved by, and then those create great unhappiness for us. Like, that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, some of the romanticization of this, uh, I just don't buy at all. I don't think that even performatively, um, makes a lot of sense given we're reading this essay hundreds of years later because it's been impactful in a way that I think Schopenhauer would find meaningful (laughs) and important. Do you think, do you think it changes anything though? If we think of it as here's a man who is almost confession, confessionally saying, this is why I am in this state of dissatisfaction today. Don't do as I do <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah, but I mean, I just think that you can say that and there's some sense in which maybe that's just sort of um, not necessarily explaining, but like just uh, expressing the the affliction that is at the heart of anything meaningful. But that's that's also kind of what it means to be human sometimes, right? Is that we mm. we take on these projects that involve lots of affliction, but we're okay with it in the end because they're meaningful to us. 
Um, mm. And to give up on that just because the affliction is there and maybe in the end, the goal that we have won't be reached. I don't think you can really give up on that. I don't think anybody can. I certainly don't think Schopenhauer did. Um, mm. It's a kind of like, it's a kind of suicide that I guess it's possible to do, but I, I don't think that that's necessarily um, something to recommend. And he doesn't either, right? He certainly says that there's a sense in which we can redeem ourselves from this um, predicament that we find ourselves in. But that's just the point again. And I make this point a lot of things on the podcast. It's just, I don't think that the, the diagnostic critique that pessimism like this gives may be right insofar as it goes, but then when the sort of solution of the redemptive aspect is that it'll sort of automatically trigger us towards, towards humility towards ourselves and compassion towards others. I don't think it's necessarily right either. I think it can, I think it's an opportunity for that, but it could also just end in nihilism. It could end in, mm. I'm just going to go out there and seek all the possible pleasures I can. Um, and you know, if I die along the way or if I'm afflicted along the way, then so be it. This is all I have in life. Or it could end mm. with a total, sort of passivity to life um, and just sort of maybe you take on the full Buddhist renunciation of life, right? The full like aestheticism and you rid yourself of desire and therefore of suffering, but that doesn't end in compassion towards others. Um, I can see that as a contingent possibility as well. So yeah, yeah, I, I just, I don't think that especially in a time of, of like political upheaval, like we have now political and social upheaval, um, where it seems like the the goalposts have been removed, but there isn't sort of a a grand um, social project happening. There never really was, probably, right? But it's coming clear, I think, to almost everybody, it's the case now, right? It's not even a facade of it existing over the over society. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to end with like exposing all of the um, lies at the heart of like the social, the social being. And then all of a sudden, like we all figure it out and we all live together in harmony because we're all humble and compassionate. Now it doesn't have to end that way. It could also end in burning fire. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I almost wonder if we, if we set ourselves up for failure and we then create our own conditions for dissatisfaction by, by sometimes uh, holding up certain images, right? Um, not all images, but certain images of a just world or certain images of humanity or cosmopolitanism or whatever. Not that we shouldn't be aspirational, but that I wonder, I think we need to be critical and we need to be aware of how it is that we might actually induce our own sort of like frenetic anxiety in relation to these abstractions that we inflate and that we try to like live up to. Right, which is just a, a a type of a form of mystification that you get, you know, similar to Feuerbach's critique of religion that Marx takes up in his early writings, where you sort of invert reality and then you subsume yourselves underneath underneath it. But it's a, almost a type of like self domestication or self alienation when we do that. And I think a lot of a lot of uh, particularly like left and radical um, political orientations can fall into that trap. Oftentimes, you know. Um, there's a quote by by D. H. Lawrence, who isn't always somebody that I know that that uh, is the greatest person to quote. <laughs> but one thing he does say is he's writing about the socialists in the 1930s in Britain, and he says um, they care so much. And what do they care about? They care so much about caring, but do they really care about people? And he was a little bit unsure about that. He's skeptical of the socialist at that point. And I think that there's this tendency sometimes if we can care so much about caring you're kind of abstracted so far away from things is that you then become um, infatuated with these fantasies, which I think relate to the anticipatory frustrations and sufferings that Schopenhauer is talking about here because it's this future thing to be realized or to be attained or to grab, and then we measure ourselves against it, and then it can induce that type of dissatisfaction and displeasure that I think that Schopenhauer is talking about here. Yeah, Dostoevsky said the same kind of thing, right, when he said that... Um the more that I love man, the more that I hate every particular man. Ooh, yeah. That's really good. Yeah, exactly. When you when you exchange the universal for the concrete, right? That's that difficult. That's why I was saying that there's something about the beauty of ordinary life. Dylan Thomas, I don't know the quote exactly I, perfectly, but I think it's this. He said that beauty is an appreciation of the ordinary. And 
it sounds so simple. And it almost doesn't even make sense at first. I'm like, that's not what beauty is. And then I, the more I think about it, the more it kind of reveals itself to me. You know? It's, it's that appreciation of the ordinary. Because we don't appreciate the ordinary, the everyday. You don't appreciate it. It's the ordinary. It's not exceptional. You don't think about it. It's just there. But it's the excess within the ordinary. It's the extraordinary within the ordinary. You know? It's that stuff, that stuff that's bursting out that I think is, that's what beauty is. I I, I kind of like that. There's something to that. What are you going to say? Li- I like that it's appreciation too. Because that's a, that's a, a, it's a dual cognitive and um, like emotional mode, right? So it brings to the heart like both sides, both the sides mm-hmm. of a person. Because uh, a dog doesn't appreciate things, right? Mm. It can enjoy them, but doesn't appreciate them. So there's something mm. cognitive as well about appreciation. It sort of recognizes your own emotional reaction to a thing and then also recognizes that it's good or that it's worthwhile or it's valuable or something like that. So yeah, I think appreciation is a mode that we don't talk about enough. It seems kind of basic, but it's actually, I think, really important. Hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, about just the everyday and the ordinary and the simple, the concrete. You know, I think it's so easy for someone who reads a lot of theoretical work and does a lot of like systemic and structural analysis to get to get lost a little bit oftentimes. In, um, I don't want to say lost in abstraction because I think that that's too often used as a term that's kind of just a dismissive term, I tend to think that actually everything is abstraction. Um, <laughs> but um, but you get lost in um, you get lost in like the fantasy world, the the world of fancy, the world that you want, rather than the world that's there, right? And that might be related to abstraction, but I don't think it's reducible to abstraction. Well, um, it's also it's also that mode where I was talking about earlier in terms of abstracting yourself from things, because to appreciate something. In some sense, you have to abstract from it, right? To think about it, and so you mm. can kind of do this dialectical mode where you get immersed in the thing, and then you abstract from it to appreciate it, and then you get back immersed in the thing as you think about it again. You kind of go back and forth with it in this kind of like uh, dance of appreciation, and that's I think a super healthy thing to do, and it also happens to be a thing that's very pleasurable and that we enjoy. Mm. Yeah. Were you thinking of Camus at all when you read this? How so? Because remember, his sort of solution that you found very dissatisfying at the end of uh, The Myth of Sisyphus is that you kind of just have this like romantic rebellion against the absurd. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? And that's kind of one course of dealing with the absurdity of suffering in the world or of just the kind of the repetitive rolling the boulder up the hill over and over again. Whereas for Schopenhauer, he kind of takes a different tack, but kind of seems to be dissatisfying to you as well. And I was wondering if, I, I didn't know if that popped up into your head, but I was thinking about it a little bit. No, that's good. I think Camus is worse. <laughs> um, because it seems like Schopenhauer's redemptive solution is at least contingently possible. But I think it's missing something. It doesn't necessarily get us towards you know compassion and humility. But I think it's like one step in the process, or at least it could help us in that process. Whereas to yeah. me, Camus is just, I think, ultimately nihilistic. Like it's just the idea of, of there being a almost like a sarcastic rebellion or something. Uh, I think it's just completely null. I don't think that gets us anywhere. I don't think anybody lives their life in such a way that um, <clears throat> they're like driven entirely by spite towards the universe. They might be driven by spite th- towards other people, but... <laughs> I do think it's funny, though, how people love to quote shit like, I stare at the void and I laugh. <laughs> it sounds badass, like, right? It does. It's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh into the abyss of nothingness. Do you? Do yeah, you? Like, Fight Club is awesome, but no one watches Fight Club and then, like, performs it. Like, no one <laughs> blew up the credit card processing buildings after Fight Club came up. They just thought it was badass if it would happen. It's like a fantasy, uh, right? You just fantasize about it for a minute and then you go on with your day. Right. Hmm. Well, all right, my fellow sufferer. Shall we <laughs> uh, wrap up this main segment here? Yeah, I thought this was fun. Um, as a little philosophical aside, as we're in the midst of all the various projects and things we do in this podcast, let's talk a little bit about suffering for an hour or so. 
Yeah. I like reading these little things too. You know, there's so much good stuff that's out there. And rather than having to read like his whole big monograph, this is kind of a nice way to kind of get into the mind of Schopenhauer as somebody that I haven't read enough of, you know? So I, I, I'm glad you suggested this. Yeah, same. And I certainly don't want to take the time to read the entirety of uh, World as Well Representation or whatever. But uh, this is a much nicer little dose. The philosophical yes. essay is a great medium, you know? It really is. Yeah. I agree. I should learn how to write them. <laughs> uh, it's one thing I think analytic philosophy does have over continental philosophy. Not entirely, because there are some great essays in continental philosophy. But I think analytic philosophy at least appreciates the, the hour-long philosophical experience as being a really important one, as opposed to the months or years long. Yeah, I know. John Paul Sartre like... much. <laughs> yes a skill I could learn, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs>All right, sick. So let's go ahead and go into our final segment of the episode. This is the Sticky Leaves. This is where one of us gets to recommend something that is bringing us joy in a world that is filled with fucking suffering. So my fellow sufferer, what is causing you some measure of minimal pleasure in relation to the maximal pain that will surely follow? What is my ephemeral experience of happiness that it immediately <laughs> disappeared into the void? Yes. Um, so, do you know the show, the BBC show? I don't know, maybe it's not BBC, the English show, Fleabag, with Phoebe Waller-Bridge? No, but I've heard so much about this. Yeah, so um, there's two seasons of this, or two series of this show. And the second series finished, I think, a couple months ago, but I didn't get to it until recently. Okay. Um, just a little background. Phoebe Waller-Bridge is the creator and star of the show and um i guess she started it by um, developing a like a one act maybe play that she did at fringe festival in edinburgh oh, cool. um, several years ago and then it got a lot of um, acclaim uh fringe and so they uh one of the stations in um england uh gave her the ability to make it into a like a six episode series a couple of years ago and she did that and i really enjoyed the first series but i wasn't necessarily fully engaged it's mostly a, a series it's called flea bag and it's about a character whose name you never know and you just refer to it as the flea bag and she's just <laughs> a uh, early 30s i think she's exactly my age actually um woman in in england who's dealing with trauma and sex and family dynamics and typical stuff but it's very well written it's extremely funny um it's pretty dark at times um and sarcastic and nihilistic but it has little bits of of hope in there as well um, nothing ultimately special, but I liked it. Then the second series came out this year, um, which I just finished. And it was like a whole different level of, mm. of, of television, of like, of, of like just literary masterpiece, I think. Wow. Um, it moved on from issues of, of sex and power and things like that into issues of love and death and God and meaning in life. And um, it just... It's almost about everything. And it's, it's six wow. episodes, 30 minutes each. So it's only three hours Jesus. long. And it's about yeah. everything. <laughs> I, I can't even believe it. It's, it's one of the greatest things on television I think I've ever seen. And wow. um, what really does it is, who's the, who's the actor who played um, on, on sh the BBC Sherlock, who played, uh, what's the villain's name? Moriarty? Sherlock. Moriarty, yeah. Oh, he's, uh, yeah, he's in the new and, Black Andrew Mirror. Andrew Scott, is that it? Yeah, he's so fucking good. He is an amazing actor, and he plays a priest who becomes the love interest for Fleabag in this series. And the dynamics between them is the most beautiful romantic thing I, I think I might have ever seen. Uh, I'm almost, like, getting emotional talking about it because of how affecting it is. Wow. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is an amazing writer. And Andrew Scott is an amazing actor. And you bring those two together and his performance and his character is just, he's a priest. I mean, this is like the okay. ultimate way for a character to be uninteresting is to be a priest, right? Um, yeah. But he is overwhelmingly magnetic in this series. Wow. I would encourage anybody out there, um, you should watch the first series because you're going to need a little bit of background to the character Fleabag. But even if you're not super into it or you think it's a little bit too much about um, contemporary cool issues in the first series, 
just be patient because the second series is overwhelming. Um, it's just brilliant and it will make you feel everything. Especially you, wow. Austin. I think you would just follow and over heels for the series. And also for, for her. What I, what I think I love most of all, and it's rare that uh, series and movies and, and books and stuff do this, but I didn't like Fleabag at all in the beginning of the series. I didn't think she was interesting. I didn't think that I cared for her much, but I heard it was mm. good, so I kept with it. And I just completely fell in love with the character. Mm. Um, and that's a unique experience because you actually get to kind of, it transforms you a little bit because you think about how your original mm. experience was maybe too judgmental or wasn't open enough. And so you can kind of think about that and transform yourself a little bit. And that's the best kind of art, right? Not only that you experience and that you enjoy, but that also transforms you in the process. Um, and it certainly is uh, a candidate for that. Wow. And it's on Netflix. Um, I don't know if the second series is. Oh, it's on Amazon, okay. I think. Maybe. Amazon. Okay. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, there's ways to find it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sold. I'm going to watch this. Nobody give me any recommendations, please, for like another couple weeks so I can just <laughs> fucking watch this because I have such a distracted brain that I will f- forget. I, this is it. Because, it's so great to be half an hour little episodes, dude. It, you can just kind of stream yeah. through it as you're eating dinner or whatever and watch one at a time because they're really you know, in depth and they're, you got to take them a little piece and pieces. Yeah. And I'm also in love with Andrew Scott at the moment. Did you he see, is, Oh my God. Cause you know, he's, he's in the second episode of the new black mirror season. Did you see which, it? Which episode was that? The one where he's like a driver and he's waiting for, um, it's like a, a Facebook. It's the one where, Topher Grace is basically playing like the Mark Zuckerberg character and uh, he holds a, a passenger for ransom. I don't remember that. Maybe I didn't see that episode. Okay. He's in it. And the episode isn't great. Like it, it isn't amazing, but he is fucking fantastic. <laughs> like otherworldly fantastic. Like, like I watched it and I couldn't believe he was that fantastic. Like that's how amazing it was. I was like, okay. The, and it's too bad because the episode was just kind of eh. But he was so good that I was like, oh, my God. So, yeah, I'm in. I'm sold. Yeah, all you need to know is that Andrew Scott's in it to know. But then also to, to get the idea that, you know, the, the writer behind him is at the peak of her powers. It's a, it's quite a melding. It's a Lennon-McCartney style thing. Okay. All right. I'm in. Fuck. If it weren't so damn late, I'd watch a few episodes right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blow through the first season. Uh Okay. It's still good, but then the second series, take it a bit at a time, like once a day. You oh, and Olivia Coleman's in it. I love her too. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. Her character is, is so great in this. <laughs> yeah, she's so fantastic. Okay. I'm super excited now. I kind of want to go to bed now so that I can start my day tomorrow so that I can watch this tomorrow evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to get your your uh, perspective on it because I think it's definitely up your alley, even more so than mine. Yeah, it's Amazon Studios. Okay, cool. All right, I'm on this. I will report back soon. Maybe it'll be my sticky leaves next episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that uh, account, should we uh, call this off? Yeah, dude, let's do it. All right, so you can find us on the various internet mediums, Twitter, at owls underscore at underscore Don. Email us at owls at Don podcast dot com. You can also look us up on Owls at Dawn. Owls at Dawn podcast at gmail.com. What did I say? You just said at podcast.com. <laughs> Is there a podcast.com? We should get on that. We got to be on that. That would everything. be cool. Owls, you said Owls at Dawn podcast.com, I think. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. But I thought Owls at Dawn podcast at gmail.com. We'll try to get back to you. We'll do our best. Um, where else can you find us? Oh, Instagram, right? Yep, search, same handle as Twitter. Just search at Don, man. There ain't no other as Isles at Don out there. Yeah, it, it's it. We that's it. We we have a monopoly on the market. Um, and then of course, reminder: movie.com slash Owls at Dawn. Get your thirty day trial. Patreon.com slash Owls at Dawn to get access to bonus content. There's a new newsletter that's out. Sorry that it was a little bit late, but we'll be uh, getting you another one. Actually, the September one here in probably a couple of weeks. It'll be out in you know probably two two three weeks. So they'll be kind of close up together. Actually, by the time this episode's out, it'll be like two weeks. Um, but uh, yeah, you can get access to bonus episodes, newsletter, as well as the Democracy Motherfuckers tier. And I think that's pretty much it. Is there anything else we got to do? Just one more thing I can think of. 
What's that? Dasta Dania Nurikamsi.